Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to another week of Trauma Recovery University. I am your host, Athena Moberg, and with us in the green room, of course, is your incredible co-host, Bobby Parrish. And who are we and are you in the right place? If you are an adult survivor of childhood abuse, specifically childhood sexual abuse, you're in the right place. We show up here every week and we do live Q&A every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for the Global Adult Survivor of Childhood Abuse community. So every single week we answer your questions. You go ahead and you tweet those in using the hashtag no more shame and we monitor that hashtag and we answer your questions and every week we have a different topic. So we have three Twitter chats a week. The first one is at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And then the second one is this one right here, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on Mondays also. And then the third Twitter chat is the original hashtag sex abuse chat with Rachel Thompson and our very own Bobby Parrish started back in January of 2014. So welcome, welcome. If this is your first time joining us, we are so excited that you are here and that you're reaching out to get connected with other survivors. This week's topic is addiction. Wow, a big topic. So are adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse more likely to have addiction or are people who are addicted more likely to be sexually assaulted? Is it both? Is it neither? What is it? What are the correlations between addiction and childhood abuse? And we're going to unpack this big, big, big topic. We're going to dispel some myths. We're going to unpack some really healthy and practical tips and strategies on how to cope with addictions and the safest way to tackle any addictions that you might be living with, which are coping strategies to probably numb, avoid, numb or avoid the pain that you have from your years of childhood sexual abuse, whether it was a one-time occurrence or if it was an ongoing occurrence for years and years, whether the abuse was in your family of origin or outside of your family of origin. We're gonna tackle all of that. We're going to interact with you. We're gonna answer your questions. And as always, we are just so excited that you are here. This is the highlight of our entire week. And as a thank you, just for being a listener or a viewer or just an awesome survivor, we have a complimentary one-page downloadable resource that sort of bullet points our topic of the week, this week's topic, addiction. You can get complimentary access to tonight's one-page downloadable resource along with our whole library of downloadable one-page resources by going to one of our websites, either nomoreshameproject.com or traumarecoveryuniversity.com. Simply look for a tab that says downloadables, click on it, and you'll be asked for your email address and you'll be given immediate access to, like I said, not only tonight's one page downloadable resource, which should be closer to the top, but our entire library, which there are hundreds of them. And we're so excited that you want access to these valuable resources that will help you, the adult survivor of child abuse, live out your life with intention and purpose and joy and freedom and, and hopefully happiness and satisfaction and fulfilling relationships and healthier boundaries and and you know sometimes we get caught up in situations with whether it's a family of origin or just some wrong thinking or some old behaviors that were taught to us or modeled for us and we Bobby and myself we exist here on this YouTube channel to help you the adult survivor find ways to live out your life in a more healthier way so that you can have the most healthy and informed trauma recovery possible because the goal is obviously wholeness and we want to help you recover from your abuse so that you can 
feel like you are a whole person and like you're not this broken or or just half of a human wandering around just sort of feeling sort of meh. You know, we really want you, we really want to support you and help you to live out your life in a way that brings you joy and peace and satisfaction. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to your incredible co-host, Bobby Parrish. And I'll go ahead and take the Twitter stream for you, Miss Bobby. And thank you so much for being here, you guys, and letting us know that you're finding the resources and that they're helpful. Take it away, Bobby. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you again and have you with us here with us talking about the relationship between addictions and childhood abuse. So before we go any further, I want to issue a trigger warning. Um, this broadcast does mention abuse and specifically sometimes sexual abuse. So please practice excellent self-care strategies while you're listening. And if you become triggered, um, just shut down the broadcast or turn off the replay and um, walk away and take some time for yourself. Uh, we really don't want to be providing information that triggers you. So if you need to take a break, then take a break by all means and come back when you're feeling better. Um, or maybe this is a topic that's helpful to you all or you need to put it off for a while. Um, whatever you need to do, take care of you. If you're in crisis right now or need help urgently and you're in the U.S., we encourage you to reach out to RAIN. That's the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network, and they are available at 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E. You can also reach them through their crisis chat feature, which is available 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 days a year on their website at rain, R-A-I-N-N dot org. If you are in the UK and you need crisis help, you can speak to the Samaritans. Um, they run an incredible organization providing crisis intervention to people across the United Kingdom. You can reach them by phone at 116-123. You can reach them by text at 07725-909090, or you can email them at joe, J-O, at samaritans.org. If you were in Australia, your national crisis hotline is 131114. I still have to memorize that one. <laughs> and as Athena said tonight, we are talking about addictions. And I really want to emphasize that this can be a topic that is triggering because there is so much shame surrounding the topic of addictions. And for us survivors who already might be carrying a lot of shame from our childhood abuse, stacking more shame on top of it can be not only very triggering, but a very, very heavy burden to carry. So if we have not completely resolved the shame from our childhood, when we add in the shame of an addiction, it can feel crushing. And unfortunately, shame can be self-perpetuating, especially when it comes to addictions. Each in our addictive behavior, we become ashamed that we engaged in our addictive behavior that adds to the shame of our abuse. And now we engage in our addictive behavior to numb the shame that we were feeling. And can you see, it just goes around in a cycle. Um, addictive behavior, shame, added to the shame of our trauma, addictive behavior to numb the shame, shame, and it just, it goes around and around and around and again. Um, and I really, 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 really want to hear have everyone hear me when I say to you that there is never, never a reason that feeling shame is healthy. Shame is never, ever a healthy response or a healthy burden for you to carry. There's never any reason for you to feel shame for any reason. Okay. Um, guilt, maybe. Guilt is... A feeling that you will have after you have done something 
that perhaps was a mistake or something you knew that you sh shouldn't have done. And that's opposed to shame. Shame is feeling that we as a person are wrong. Okay, so guilt is that we feel bad because we did something wrong. Shame is we feel bad because we are wrong. This is never healthy and it's never anything we should be carrying around. We have no, we should have no shame from our childhood abuse and we should have no shame from engaging in any kind of addictive behavior as we coped to survive. And we talked about that this morning in chat. And I just want to bring it up again, that if you have engaged in some addictive behavior to help cope with the pain of your childhood abuse, it's not your fault. And you have no reason to feel ashamed about that. Is it your responsibility to fix it? Yeah, it is. And that's not fair because it wasn't your fault that it happened. And now you have the responsibility to go through the hard work of having to fix it. But <laughs> if you're feeling shame about anything that you have done with an addictive behavior, just kick that right to the curb because that doesn't belong to you. Shame never belongs to you. So I wanted to make sure we talked about that before we went any further because otherwise it can be a very triggering topic to discuss and it can be very hard for us to admit that we have addictions. Usually when we talk about addictions, people think alcoholism or substance abuse, but there are so many other things that we can become addicted to. And we talked about a few of them this morning in chat. People talked about different ones, but there's everything. We can be addicted to love, work, exercise, video games, pornography, food, there's a big one. Um, I read something this morning as I was doing research that people can become addicted to tanning, right? Did I say the internet? The internet. Um, your phone you can become addicted to having your phone with you wherever you go. Athena, are there others? Uh, people Other pleasing. Addictions? People there you go. People pleasing is a huge addiction, you guys. In fact, it's a deadly one. I happen to know somebody personally who, in order to please their toxic family member who told them they would be a terrible parent, had an abortion because they wanted to be in the good graces of their family member. So they decided to have an abortion in an effort to please an unpleasable toxic family member. And then all that did was cause them to feel shame, which shame is a component of every single addiction there is. It's a necessary component. Like when you are addicted to something, you automatically feel like you want to, uh, you, you regret what it is that you did and you want to hide and you shame yourself or you're shamed by others. And it all is just a circle and 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 a circle. You do the behavior, you feel guilty about it, you wanna hide, you wanna run, you shame yourself in order to numb the pain that the shame causes. You do the behavior and then you feel horrible and then you want to hide and then you shame yourself and in order to numb the shame, you do the thing and then it just goes around and around. So people pleasing is much the same way. And I am a recovering people pleaser addict person. In fact, I still fall into people pleasing behavior. Um, it's easy for me to do. If someone that I meet, um, it's almost like there's a chemical response in some way. If someone is familiar, like the way they behave or the way they communicate is familiar to me in a way that my toxic family of origin communicated or bullied or sort of like the same like posture about them or the way that they form their words or the way that they ask very pointed pointed questions that are um, not real questions and they're not even rhetorical questions. They are questions that can only garner a response that would cause me to feel ashamed. That is one of my abusers, my main abusers, primary mode of communication. That is asking questions that can only garner a response 
that would make me look bad and would cause me to feel ashamed. And so then I get on the treadmill of people pleasing, trying to be on that treadmill so that I can please that person so that I don't feel as crappy as I felt a moment before when they asked me that question. So um, the way to get past a, a people pleasing addiction is a little bit different. There are 12 step programs. There are 12 step programs for people pleasing. It's called um, CODA, uh, Codependence Anonymous. Um, codependency is is the overarching, Bobby, what's the word? You're my brain. Um, codepe codependency is the end result of people pleasing. Like it's, it's people pleasing is one of the ingredients of, of codependency is what I'm saying. Yes. They're not, they're not synonymous. Yes. They're not synonymous, but it's difficult for someone to be codependent if they are not already people pleasing. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So people pleasing is one of them. You guys, pornography, sex. Um, we talked a lot about sex being currency during, during chat this morning when we were, when we were groomed as children, um, many of us were taught that sort of sex or sort of sultry behavior or like just that flirtatiousness or that, that attention seeking behavior, just a way of life. That's like, that's how you live. That's how you got what you needed. That's how you got safety. That's how you got clothing. That's how you got attention. That's how you got food. That's, that's how you lived. <laughs> and then, so that becomes an addiction, which you end up then feeling really ashamed of. And then to cope with how shameful that feels, you find something else to be addicted to, <laughs> you know, like over exercising or controlling your calories or, um, um, I know people who, like Bobby was mentioning earlier, um, they get really into working out and then working out isn't enough. So they decide that they're going to take just a couple of steroids or like, you know, do some protein powder. They start with the creatine and the protein powder first, which is totally healthy and good and legal. And then they like slip into some other stuff. And then they see someone who's a little bit bigger and a little bit more cut and a little bit more ripped. And then they start asking some questions and they start Googling some stuff. And then and they find this website and it's in Canada and they're like, well, can I get away with this? And it's just, it's a slippery slope, you guys, like seriously, it's a slippery slope addiction. Um, but while we, while Bobby and I are here to clearly communicate to you that we don't want you needlessly shaming yourself for the addiction itself, we also are standing here firmly and exhorting you and encouraging you to take responsibility for your actions. The addiction in and of itself is not your fault because it happened as a result of your abuse and it's a coping strategy to numb or avoid your pain. However, the result of your addiction could be destroyed relationships or like myself, I can only speak for me, destroyed immune system, destroyed body and colon. I mean, I was not only did I, not only did I control my calories, and I got it down to just a few hundred calories a day, but I would only eat foods that were non-fat and I would only eat foods that had, you know, this many calories in them. I would only eat this, this many times per day. And then that wasn't enough. I, I slipped into from anorexia. I, it, anorexia turned into bulimia, but I wasn't brave like the other girls that threw up. I wasn't brave enough to throw up because my mom made very, made it very clear to me that I wasn't allowed to ruin my teeth because because she spent money on my teeth. And if I did anything to ruin my teeth, I'd be, really be sorry. And so what did I do? I saved up all my money and went and bought some laxatives. So then while I was controlling my calories, I took me some laxatives. And I then it came to, to the point where I couldn't eat any food without taking laxatives because I couldn't get skinny enough. Skinny wasn't skinny enough. I could see my ribs. I could see the bones in my legs, but I wasn't skinny enough. I was fat. So it... And then I felt shamed, ashamed about that. So I found something else to be addicted to. I mean, just like I never dealt with the root issue until years later, many years later. So um, I'm responsible for the repercussions. I'm responsible for the damaged body and damaged body parts that I have as a result of my addiction. I'm also responsible for the damaged relationships that I have. And it was my responsibility to, to, to address those things, even though... 
the addiction itself and what and what I fell into wasn't necessarily my fault because it was a result of my childhood abuse and exploitation and sexual abuse and all kinds of other forms of abuse wasn't my fault but it was my responsibility to to uh, take responsibility for my actions and to make healthy choices so there's a little tough love for myself wasn't fun huh Bobby it's never fun tough love's never, it's never fun. fun it's never fun but <laughs> I think we have the right to feel angry about that injustice oh yes that <laughs> we were treated in such a way that in order to cope, we turned to something that was so dysfunctional that it had the capacity to take out our entire life. And there, there's no addiction that's healthy. Um, you know, I don't think people realize that binge eating disorder, which is an addiction to binging on food, is the most lethal of all eating disorders. Um, I think there's a societal thought that it's probably, you know, anorexia or bulimia, but that, that binging behavior, that um, binge eating disorder is the most lethal of all eating disorders. And so we need to be aware of what we're doing to our bodies, what we're doing to our minds, what we're doing to ourselves and we're the ones that have to fix it and it's not fair and all of us have the right to be angry about that um, and it's okay to express that anger and it's okay in fact it's good to express that anger rather than sit there and hold it in because sometimes anger can feed an addiction um, I had a couple of questions on the Twitter stream that I wanted to go ahead and address and Liz asked, she said that she used to use alcohol to um, numb her feelings of pain, but that she was able to stop doing it, realized it was problematic and stop doing it. And she wanted to know if that was an addiction. So I wanna clarify that we can use alcohol, substances, other things as numbing the word I want as ways to numb our pain without becoming addicted to them okay so there are people who can drink or do drugs to numb their their feelings the pain and everything that's swirling of the shame that's feeling around inside them from their abuse but they don't become addicted they don't develop that physical component of addiction to the substance there are people who um, eat to comfort themselves and to feel better, but they don't become addicted to food. So there is there is a difference. And I don't think, I, I want people to know that not every person who uses alcohol to numb develops an addiction. Is it a healthy thing to do? No. Should you stop doing it? Yep. Um, but it doesn't mean that it is that you've become addicted to it, that you're an alcoholic or that you're a drug addict. Um, and then someone else asked a question. Oh, Joey asked whether or not um, self-harming behavior is addictive. And yes, some self-harming behavior is addictive. Uh, it can be much along the lines of um, sometimes we self-harm to cope and to numb, but that compulsion component isn't behind us, behind it. We don't feel compelled to self-harm. And in that case, it's not addictive, but it's still harmful. And it's still something that we should get help for, that we deserve to have the skills, the healthy skills, not to do that anymore. So it can be addictive. It depends on whether or not you've got that compulsive, an element behind it. And a compulsion is something that you feel the urge to do and you feel like you don't have any control over the urge. 
Okay. Ooh, or oh, I, I wanted to uh -huh. add some, I'm so sorry. I want to add something, Bobby. You, it, either you feel you don't have any control over the urge initially, or um, it can also be you don't realize you've done it until later, obviously, because you didn't have control over it. But I'm just I'm just saying like like a light bulb went off for me when someone mentioned this, and that is you don't even realize you've done something until later. Can you so, describe that some more, Athena? Okay, let me, give you, let me give you a great example. Yes, yes, a okay. love example. <laughs> you're, you're visual, so okay, so you all know I that am. I, okay, so Bobby, right here, okay, so you see how long my fingernails are right now? Yes. And they're all, they're all painted, so. Right. I have, I have all my fingernails painted and I'm so excited because you guys know that one of the ways that I would dissociate when I was little during my abuse is I would bite my fingernails and I'd bite them really and then I was shamed and I was forced to carry a little Ziploc, not even a Ziploc, they weren't even the expensive Ziplocs with the red and yellow or blue and yellow make green. Like it wasn't even, it was the, it was the cheap fold over sandwich baggies that were like the store bought brand. They weren't even like a name brand filled with horse manure to dip my fingers in. Okay, so I have a lot of shame when it comes to my fingernails. In fact, my body dysmorphia started at age four, I'm, I'm realizing, and it was all about my hands. I would hide my hands. I would hide my hands in my, in my, in my clothes, in my shirts, even if like I had to keep my hands inside my arms of my clothes like this, like a dork. Like I would just, I didn't care. I was like needed to hide my hands, right? So obsessed with hiding my hands, obsessed with my hands. So here I am, 43 years old, 43 in a week, and I still have issues with my hands. My body dysmorphia is stronger than ever, and I am not over it. And I went to get my nails painted by the girl. I got a, a gift certificate from my husband to get my nails, get my nails done. So the gal, the little, the little gal, which it's already, you guys, it's already triggering for me to go to the nail salon because you guys, I, I already told you about the whole situation where I got traipsed into the nail salon like a little Barbie doll. So here, like I have like a cuticle, Bobby. Yes. Uh -huh. I don't know if you, can you, I uh -huh. don't know if you, I okay. See it. So I, unknowingly, I, I pick, I don't even know I'm doing it. The gal goes, why are you picking your fingers? you need to stop or like tells me I need to stop. And like, I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> she said, yes, I see. And I'm like, well, I don't even, I must do it without even realizing I'm doing it then. Because I don't consciously pick the skin around my nails. In fact, I go out of my way not to. I, I put lotion on, I use coconut oil. But here I am, days later, or however many, however long it's been later, and someone's pointing out, "Hey, you're doing this," and I'm realizing I must have done that. Like, and it's it's a compulsion. Like, it's something that I used to do continu continuously, and it was like my favorite coping strategy because you have to be fully fully concentrated in order to bite your fingernails properly. Otherwise, you'll hurt yourself or you'll bleed. It's like hundred percent concentration on biting that fingernail. And it takes you away from whatever's going on. Well, I'm still doing something similar because I look down and she's right. Like the whole area of my thumb was completely ripped apart. Like I was doing something to it and I didn't even realize I was doing it. So obviously it is what you were saying. Like you don't have control over it, but I feel like there's another element to some addictions and this could fall under the category of like a disorder perhaps almost like trick to how do you say it trick to when you pick your when you pick your pick your hair you pick your skin pick your hair trictola something yeah trictolomania I, something like that trictolomania yeah, yeah which a lot of survivors a lot of survivors but that's a disorder and not necessarily addiction kind of like this morning when um, I believe it was Lucy asked if OCD is an addiction, which it's a disorder and it's not, it's not necessarily an addiction. Right. Um, but I'm doing but addictions are compulsions and we don't have control over them. So it's like this weird fine line, but like, not only do I not have control over it, Bobby, but I don't even realize I'm doing it until someone points it out. Like, 
I'm not even realizing that I'm doing it. Or even, remember the self-sabotaging thing that I did last week when you're like, and Athena, why are you leaving? Or why do you have to hurry up? And I'm like, well, because we right. had sound issues. And you're like, no, what's today? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's her birthday. <laughs> you know? Um, so do you know what I mean about like the component that's added on top of the fact that we don't have control over it, but like there's like almost like an added, like you don't even realize you're doing it. Right, right. And I think that's that that definitely can be part of an addiction because it takes into the account how mindlessly we engage in the behavior. Like people who abuse food, usually or or in a healthy world, in a healthy ideal world. We eat and we're fully present and we enjoy the tastes of the food and we're there to nourish our bodies and to, you know, have a, a meal with other people to interact and because the food should taste good. But when it's an addiction, that's not what it's about. There's, there's, it's not about eating in community. It's not even really about this is going to taste good. It's about, I am going to eat this to experience comfort. And so I, I do think there can definitely be an element of not even being fully present when you engage in it. You know, your mind is off completely someplace else. You're, it's very hard to engage in an addiction and be mindful at the same time. Let's put it that way. I think that mindfulness is something that is often used in recovery programs to help people as they cope with their addictive behavior, especially if it has to do with anything around a food addiction. Um, I've seen that. I've seen that very often. So yeah, I, I agree, Athena. I think there is definitely a part of being on autopilot, you know, not being mindful um, I want to say the opposite of being mindful is being mindless, but that's a terrible word to use, so I won't use that. Um, and, I, and I agree. I agree. So let's see. Let's check and see if we have any other questions. People are talking about um, addictions that talking about oh, their fingernails. Liz, Liz says she twists her hair. I used to do that, Liz. I used to sit for hours and just and I even did it to the point where these little hairs right here were shorter than all the rest of my hairs because I had twirled it so much that my hair had like broken off that yeah like I I literally twirled my hair to the point where my hair broke off so and I didn't yeah yeah I didn't I didn't even realize I was doing it there's that there's again there's that mindless component to it which is shameful like I like I don't want to not be fully present and like I'm shaming myself while I'm sitting here listening like acknowledging it and I'm supposed to be sitting here telling you all not to shame yourselves you know like we never show up here trying to say we've arrived like we've never we're not we're just we're recovering right alongside you we're just choosing to do it in public but I mean Bobby and I do want to encourage you and encourage ourselves not to shame ourselves like nothing good comes from shame it doesn't matter what behavior you're trying to change if you're trying to change the behavior through shame it's an unhealthy way to change the behavior if you are fat shaming yourself into exercising and losing weight you will likely almost positively gain back the weight if not more it's a proven fact google it the statistics are there. If you are shaming yourself to quit doing a certain behavior and you're doing it, you're, you're, you're using shame based behavior, it is likely that you will not only end up doing that behavior again, but end up doing it more or worse. Right. Because what you're doing is you're feeding the root cause. Yes. You know, and then it's just you're making it more likely that you'll engage in that behavior. Um, so shame is, and, and I, I see us do it, that shame is never a good way to encourage yourself to stop doing something, um, whether it's something that you think is wrong or unhealthy. 
or, you know, sometimes we can shame ourselves for doing things that are not actually problematic. You know, if you have body dysmorphia, you might look at yourself and shame yourself because you think you're fat, when in reality, you're not. So you try to use the shame to, to um, lower your thoughts and feelings about eating, to restrict your calories even more, to exercise even more. But the reality is that the problem is not that you're fat. The problem is, is that you have a distorted view of yourself because of the abuse that happened to you as a child. So um, now shame is, shame is never a good thing and it's never healthy. And there's never ever a reason for any of you to ever feel shame. There's never a reason for anybody in the world um, to feel shame. Because shame means that you feel like you're a bad person. And, you know, I suppose there might be a very, 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 very slim percentage of people who fall into the sociopath psychopath column that it would be hard to say, um, you know, there were a lot of redeeming qualities in that individual. But if you're here and you're listening to this and you've sought this out because you are a survivor and you've sought this out because you want to get better, that's not you. You're a good person. You've been good since you were born. You've deserved love since you were born. Um, but you got cheated. And so one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your adult life is learn to love yourself and learn to kick that shame to the curb. So I want to address a question that Sidra brought up. Um, and she was talking about, do we tackle she brought up the issue that she's seen survivors who have addictions who use 12 step programs in order to tackle their addiction and then they deal with their trauma. And we talked about that a little bit um, in chat this morning in terms of if our child abuse, if the shame and the lack of self worth and um, all of the things that happened to us as a child, the emotional pain, are at the root of our addictions, in what order do we tackle things? How do we tackle things? Do we tackle the addictions and then the trauma? Or the trauma and then addictions? Or do we do them both at the same time? <coughs> and it's me, sorry. That's okay. There's no up. one size, bless you. I woke up with a cold today. <laughs> There's no one size fits all answer. To that question. The only one size fits all answer to that I have is what not to do. And never just tackle your addictions, become clean and sober for a particular addiction, and then walk away and never address the underlying root cause of your addiction. Because I can tell you what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that while you may be clean and sober from alcohol, you still have that underlying pain, you still need to numb that under underlying pain, and you're going to develop another addiction. Perhaps it won't be as toxic as alcoholism, because you saw firsthand how terrible and how lethal that addiction could be. So now perhaps you're going to develop an addiction to exercising. You're going to develop an addiction to caffeine. You are going to um, become addicted to nicotine. That's one we haven't talked about. Ooh, we didn't start even smoking mention that this morning. Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting. When I was a child, um, my grandfather was a raging, mean alcoholic. I think when I was maybe about 10 or 11 o'clock, where does that come from? 10 or 11 years old o'clock. Wow. Um, a little disconnect there inside my brain. When I was 10 or 11 years old, he became sober from the alcoholism. 
But then he developed an addiction to something else. And so while he may have been sober on his alcohol addiction, he just transferred it over to something else. And it was just as damaging and just as harmful. But at, at his age, for his generation, you didn't tackle that underlying stuff. You know, you didn't address your trauma, you didn't address your abuse. Um, but that's the one thing I can tell you for sure, is that if you're gonna deal with your addiction, at some point, you've got to deal with the things that caused you to turn to the addiction, that caused that disease to rise up inside of you. Whether you, um, and, and I'm with Sandra, I have heard, I have some therapists who I've worked with, some peers who won't take a client to deal with trauma issues unless they're sober from all their addictions. So they want them to get sober first and then they'll help them deal with their trauma. Which isn't a bad thing to do when you're dealing with someone on an outpatient basis. Other people can, inpatient rehab is an excellent place to tackle both at the same time. Tackle your addiction and tackle the underlying issues at the same time because you have that 24 hour support. It's very hard. Um, and I, I want to hear everyone say this, if you're watching this and you have a severe addiction, it's very hard to deal with both the addiction and the underlying issues at the same time with any depth. You need help. Um, and addictions are something that we need a lot of help and support to tackle. So I definitely recommend you look into getting professional help, whether it's through therapy or a treatment program or 12 step groups. Um, but I'm not sure there's a, a wrong or a, a right way to do your trauma work and get your treatment for addictions. The only wrong way to do it is get the treatment for the addiction and never deal with what took you to that addiction because chances are you just end up being addicted to something else to ease and cope with that pain. So, um, any other questions, Athena? No, not at this time. Um, I don't, I don't see any other, uh, oh, um, Patricia says a support system is important to healing. I agree, Patricia, and it is on our one page. Most definitely it's at, it's one of our bullet points. Um, having a healthy support system in place, you guys, whether it's um, accountability. In fact, in fact, I left um, Joey a message today actually letting her know about the self-harm. I said um, exactly what you just said, almost verbatim, Bobby, about the inpatient. And then yeah. I, I said, you know, if you're seeing a therapist on a weekly basis and you're dealing with your root trauma, which is childhood abuse and other forms of abuse that's ongoing, um, then also ask for, ask your therapist for accountability. Let her know I'm living with self-harming behaviors. I believe these self-harming behaviors are addictive. I would like to stop these self-harming behaviors and I would like you to hold me accountable and help me set myself up for success. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, um I just, Go ahead. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say, there, I saw something from Matt on the Twitter stream talking about, can we become addicted to recovery? Yeah, to healing. It. I was just going to, we were going to say the same thing at the same moment. Can we become addicted to healing and recovering? Yes. 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 I think we can be, not, I don't know how to say whether it's a heal. It's, I don't mm. think it's an addiction to healing. No. Because an addiction is never about healing and addiction is about coping but i think yeah. we can become addicted to the recovery the process of recovery in terms of using support groups and resources to numb and cope with our pain rather than using them to help us move forward in our recovery process 
I agree. And the fact Does that makes sense. Okay. Well, and and here, Bobby, like right here, like we we get addicted to this, the knowledge, the the finding, the fi the looking, the the. Yeah. It's kind of like they talk about how heroin addicts, it's not even necessarily the feeling of the heroin, um, the the numb that they get necessarily. It's the romantic relationship that they have when they use the the um, the band that they use to um, to cut off their their blood pressure. What is that called when they when they tie off the, their arm? The tourniquet. Like it's like they tie their arm off, you know, so that they can find a good vein. But it's the whole, they, they become addicted and there's almost a room, they romanticize the tying off and the needle and like they, they romanticize the whole rhythm and system in which they have to get the end result. So, and it's up here, we, like when we're, if we're becoming addicted, not necessarily like Bobby said to healing or recovery, but if our if our relationships and our work and and other people things other things in our life are suffering as a result of us focusing on the knowledge, the knowledge base that we are searching to learn about symptoms and learn about things and stuff that can help us recover, and that release that we get when like you like like if you guys have ever seen that that movie um fight club when edward norton's character meets helen helen bonham carter's character and their 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 recovery group hopping that release that endorphin release that you get when you tell your story and when you share and it's like I honestly Bobby I think we need to spend a couple minutes on this because this I can I can already see that this is going to cause kind of like a like an uproar so we're not suggesting that you looking to heal and recover is a bad thing obviously but we are saying that the process if if it is at the expense of relationships or your job or your health, then you could probably want to make sure that you have some checks and balances in place or some accountability in place so that you don't become addicted to the process. Bobby, your comments on that? Um, I want to be really, really, really careful. Sorry. Um, I want to be really careful right here. Because yes. I can't tell you how many times I have had the spouse of someone in recovery say to me, will you tell her or him that they're spending too much time on this and I just, I, I need them, you know, back the way they were. I need them to focus on me. I need them to focus on us. And she's just, she, he is spending too much time doing this. And more often than not, that's about the spouse being uncomfortable with the person who's in recovery, the changes that they're making. They're becoming healthy. Right. So I don't want any spouse out there or I don't want us. I don't want my being in recovery when I'm when I'm working my program, when I'm getting the help I need. I don't want anyone out there to sit there and worry that focusing on themselves, self-care, being in recovery is unhealthy. There's that there's that fine line and that balance between doing the work you need to do, spending the time you need to spend on it, rather than engulfing yourself in the process as another way to numb your pain. Does, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense the way you said it. I want to I want to bring it home and really repeat what Bobby just said. And that is that if you are using your recovery journey, if intuitively you know that you're using your recovery process as a means to busy, that's when we didn't write down, Bobby, busyness. Busyness is an addiction. 
Yes, yes. So if you are using your recovery or this this journey as a means to busy yourself to numb your pain and not deal with your stuff, the way you would know if that was true is if you were not experiencing growth in your recovery journey. If there's not growth, if you're not actually moving along in your recovery journey. This is where I think the the um, the Moberg Parish trauma um, the the trauma response the model uh -huh. this would this would be really really helpful as a visual I think because for instance if if you were triggered to you go back to the beginning you you have a new trauma and you get triggered okay and you're oh, pretty far along in your recovery journey so it takes you back to your root trauma and then you move through the model again which you know you move through chaos and you move into recovery and then you're reclaiming your life and then you you end up um, advocating for others and finding a purpose for your pain if there's no growth if you're not moving through the model and you're moving from trauma to chaos to trauma to chaos to trauma to chaos to trauma to chaos to trauma to chaos and you're not recovering and you're not reclaiming your life and you're not finding purpose for what it is that you've been through and advocating for others, you're not moving through your recovery journey, then that might be a red flag, Bobby. Wouldn't you agree that that would be a red flag? Because we're gonna obviously get asked the question, well, how do we make sure we don't do that? How do we make sure that we're not using our using this, this recovery as a means to numb our pain? Like, I know that that question's gonna come up immediately. It's gonna. So don't you think if it, it's a good way to say, the way that we could safeguard, the way that we could know that, that we're not doing that, is if we are in fact experiencing growth in our, in our journey. Like, and sometimes we don't know when we're experiencing growth. We have a video about that. Like, Harry, if you could pop up the video that says, how do you know if you're experiencing growth in your recovery journey or if we're, if we're, if we're experiencing, I think it's experiencing growth in your recovery. Um, but Bobby, don't you think that's a good way to know whether or not you're using your that your recovery is becoming a means to numb your pain um, rather than as an actual recovery? Is if you're getting stuck in chaos and then you're getting you're going back to your trauma and then you get it go back to the root and then you're in chaos and then you never really move through the like you're not there's not growth there's not obvious growth. Don't you think that's a good way to know? Yeah, I think being I think being stuck in the chaos is an excellent way to put it because sometimes we can use that chaos to cope and numb with our pain in fact one of the key um, ways to tell if someone is stuck in the chaos is if they're using things to numb and cope um, and I think not moving past that you know after a reasonable amount of time it's definitely a sign that there are other things that you are doing that are causing you to stay stuck in that cycle. I think another way to tell that you might be using the process to numb and cope would be the amount of time and the reason that you spend interacting with other survivors. Um, do you do you interact with other survivors in order to tell your story in order to um, let's see the word that I want to oh no it's completely lost me my train of thought went out um, we can we can go to support groups you can become involved in support groups as a way to numb and cope and if we find ourselves telling our same story over and over and over and over and over again that is an indication too that we may be using the support groups for a reason to get something other than moving forward in our recovery um, when my father became sober from alcoholism, he actually became addicted to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and the process. So he would spend hours, hours every day at AA meetings. 
he would man the hotline. I can remember being at, um, at Christmas dinner and he was over on the phone for hours and hours. And not that we don't need to go to meetings, not that we don't need to man the hotlines, but when manning the hotlines and going to the meetings becomes a way to cope rather than a way to help, that's where it all falls apart. Yeah. So I guess to look at your underlying motive. Yes. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing it to cope or are you doing it to move forward? in your recovery process? Are you doing it to move forward from um, being just a survivor to being an advocate for others? So it it's a sticky one and I can honestly it's say- It's a fine it, line. It's a it fine is. line, Bobby. It is because I mean, for instance, I, everything you just said is so valid, Bobby. And, and I, there is also Liz. Liz just said that being busy helps her to move forward and not get stuck in depression. But busyness is, it's very sticky, Liz, because I am one that can easily fall into busyness and use that as a means to sort of avoid. Because I know that if I slow down long enough that I'll slip into that depression or I'll slip into that behavior. And that is a good indicator for me personally that I'm not dealing with the root issue. What I have to ask myself the hard question, which is, what am I avoiding? I'm, am I, am there you I, go. you know, what am I avoiding? Excellent question to ask that can help you tell the difference too. Yeah. Am I doing this to avoid something rather than because it needs to be done? Well, yeah, being busy doesn't need to be done though. Like for me, I know that being busy is just another thing. Right. That, I'm, that I'm using. It's not right. It's not a means to an end. It's not the end. It's just something I'm doing to buy time so that I don't have to deal with the real issue. And that's just me personally. I'm not. I'm not pointing you out, Liz. I'm. I'm saying for me personally, like I know myself, and I have a family member, busy, 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 volunteering, doing, and it's all good stuff. You know, volunteering for the community, volunteering for this society, volunteering, having this candle party, having this. Um, Lulu LaRoe party, having this pampered chef party, going to this event, going to this cancer walk, going and, and volunteering at Goodwill, going to the Salvation Army, going on Thanksgiving and serving the homeless. I mean, there every single day of every single month, there is something planned. There is never a moment of downtime. And it begs the question, what would you do if you had a moment of downtime? Like, I mean, I've, I mean, I've asked my family member, you know, like, do you ever have any downtime? And like, the answer is like, well, I'll sleep when I'm dead, you know, like, okay, but what are you avoiding? Like, is normal paced life and reality? Like, like if your thoughts slow down, what is it that's facing that you're facing? What is that? Yeah. Yes, yes. That, that you just slowing want. down, right. Just slowing down cause you distress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a clear indication that maybe you're using that busyness for something other than a healthy. Yeah. You know, in a healthy way. I agree. Um, and this particular family member, when I ask them that, whenever they slow down, they choose to numb they, they choose that, well, the only time I slow down is to go to a party. And then the party is usually alcohol and recreational drugs. So in it, like after they're done numbing with busyness and they slow down, they numb with alcohol and drugs. And then they sleep, wake up, rinse, repeat, sleep, wake up, rinse, repeat. Like yeah. busy, busy, slow, numb, alcohol, drugs, go to sleep, wake up, rinse, repeat. It's like... Wow, there we have to. What is that? Who said that, Bobby? Know thyself. Um, who said that? Know thyself. It's like Zhao Tu or something. I don't know. Shakespeare. Zhao. <laughs> know thyself. Um, Zhao Dao something. I know one of our people on Twitter right now is going to be like, "Here's the quote. Here's who said it." 
um, with a meme, that would be so helpful for our Storify someone out there. Um, but yeah, we really need to have self-awareness. We really need the only answer to that question, Liz, I think is if you need to be able to really do have a very sober self-assessment, pun intended, sober self-assessment. <laughs> but I'm just saying, be able to really look at yourself and really know yourself and know, okay, am I numbing myself through busyness so that I don't have to deal with something? <laughs> <laughs> like Athena, because that's what she does. <laughs> or am I staying busy because it's helpful and I'm actually, there is, I can look back and I can see some growth in my recovery journey. I'm dealing with my stuff. I'm actually processing things. I, I handle things differently now. I have different relationships. I have healthier relationships. My relationships are growing. I'm growing. Um, life is improving overall. You know, like there are some indicators. Right, Bobby? Yes, that's an excellent way to put it. I love that. Um, and August was asking, is it but is it okay to avoid sometimes? You know, sometimes feel things feel so overwhelming, and we don't have the resources to feel like we can, if we just let all those feelings and emotions go. We don't feel like we have the resources to stand um, that they will feel overwhelming. And yeah, it's okay to avoid sometimes. Absolutely okay. It's a coping mechanism. The problem is when, as it is with any coping mechanism, when you overuse it and when you use it to prevent your recovery, when you use it to undermine your recovery, that's when it becomes problematic. So absolutely, August, I give you complete and total permission to avoid every once in a while, wrap yourself up in a big blanket, sit down and watch a movie. Um, perfect. Um, if you're doing it every night of the week, that's another story. But, um, yeah, avoidance is okay. Having a glass of wine is okay. Um, you know, eating five cookies at a time is okay. If it's sporadic and if it's infrequent, it, the problem comes when we use those behaviors to cope and to numb. Um, the behaviors otherwise when done in balance when done you know in moderation they're all okay um, and there's nothing wrong with having a few cookies watching a movie and drinking a glass of wine um, there's nothing wrong with today I really need to spend a few hours just to, to drown out everything else and just focus on my recovery and maybe that means dinner isn't going to be on the table at the time everyone else wants it to be. And maybe that, um, you know, means that I'm not gonna get the chance to go out and mow the yard like I maybe should have today. That's, that's okay. But when you isolate yourself to the um, destruction of your family and your relationships, when you find yourself, you know, sitting at, um, support group meetings, lectures, seminars, conferences, to the point that there's no room for anything else in your life, then you have a problem. So maybe that's another line to tell difference if you're doing something in moderation versus it's consuming, you know, a large part of your time, a large part of your life. Um, I hope that helps. I don't, I think, want, I don't want everyone out there going, oh no, maybe they're talking about me. Maybe I'm I know. to my own recovery. And We're I not stop. talking about any of you. And you mentioned two others that are not on the one page, Bobby. Sleep and isolation. We can get addicted to isolating and we can get addicted to sleeping because sleeping is really good avoidance, really good coping strategy. If I'm just asleep, then I won't have to deal with stuff. That's a lot of a lot of people um, that are that are dealing with um, extraordinary circumstances, extenuating circumstances, like if they're going through recovery from abuse, hello. Um, I've heard so many people, I've even heard myself say this, like I just wish I could just go to sleep and never wake up. Like 
Yeah, I think yeah. that is dysfunctional behavior, but I'm not sure it's an addiction because I don't see a, a compulsion behind that. I mean, if, if that person feels like, oh my gosh, I just have to go to sleep. I don't have any control over the fact that I need to go to sleep. Like it's an avoidance though. Like, like I'm going to go. Yes, it's dysfunctional. It's absolutely yeah. dysfunctional. I'm going to go I take don't some think it rises to the to point of right addiction. Now. Oh, okay. Like if I'm going to go take a couple of sleeping pills right now and go and go to sleep so I don't have to deal with the world. Yep. As long as it's a compulsion, as long as there's the compulsive element to that, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, sleeping inordinate amounts of sleep is, is a good thing. It's still dysfunctional. It's just not an addiction. Got it. Um, Iso isolation can be an addiction, though. We can compulsively isolate. I know we mentioned that before about um, knowing that we should, like, we are really, like, you mentioned this during self-sabotage last week, which. Um, right. Knowing we should go out, we should get out, we should interact with other people. And looking forward to it. That's We've been planning it. It's been on the calendar. Like, oh, I'm looking forward to this event. And then the event comes up and their anxiety kicks in to the point where they're like, you know what? I'm just not going to go. And they just decide not to go, which is fine because it's almost like self-care. But if it happens every time, like that's what we're, what you and I were just um, talking about last week and this week, like everything in moderation, you guys, like if, if you are, you know, um, if something becomes a pattern of behavior and it is the rule rather than the exception, and like Bobby said, there's a compulsive element to it, definitely ask yourself those tough questions. Would you Bobby like to says go Socrates. Socrates said, know that, know thyself? Yes. Uh -huh. Who said that? Dawn. Oh, good. Thank you, Don. I knew someone. I knew someone would look it up. <laughs> um, would you like to do the one page, Bobby? Yes, let's. Awesome. All right, guys. So we're going to transition into the teaching portion of tonight's broadcast. If this is your first time here, every single week we do a one page downloadable resource, sort of like a blog post. Whoops. Oh, oh, oh what is that? Sorry, that's a oh, weather. That's right. Oh, oh, are you That's having a weather, a weather siren on my phone? Are you having a weather alert? Are you guys having yeah. like a tornado? I don't know. I have to look here for a minute. I, I silenced it so quickly that I don't know what it was trying to tell me. Oh, no, we want you to be safe. Hello. Yeah. Um, so we're going to transition to the teaching portion of tonight's broadcast. Every week we have sort of a blog post slash it's a one page bullet point resource for you that that is helpful for um, the topic that we're discussing of the week this week obviously is addiction you can get complimentary access uh, by going to um, no more shame project.com or trauma recovery university.com look for a tab that says downloadables and you will be given immediate access after I believe you get asked your email address and then you'll get be given immediate access to tonight's resource which is titled um, Survivors and Addictions, one page. And Bobby's going to go ahead and do our teaching portion now. Oh, I'm sorry, Athena. I clicked present all prematurely there. My weather siren flustered me. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. I, ha I have you. I'm, I'm looking at it. I see it. It looks okay. great. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, survivors of childhood abuse are extremely vulnerable to developing addictions both in adolescence and adulthood. And I think it's important to, to notice everyone that we've we're talking about adolescence as well. Um, so we're not talking about limiting this to discuss, discussions about adults. If someone turns to drug and alcohol as a teenager, that's a particular, a particular indication there, that there is some family, there may be some family dysfunction or abuse going on at home. Research shows that anywhere from 50 to 90% of those with an addiction were abused in childhood, which is a horrific statistic. To help cope with the debilitating after effects of our abuse, we can turn to a means 
even a very dysfunctional one, to numb or avoid our pain. Many things, aside from the usually stated alcohol and drugs, can become the target of our addictions. Food, pornography, shopping, the internet, exercise, love, work, people pleasing, video gaming, um, and we were just talking in the Twitter stream, nicotine, caffeine, um, all of those things can be addictions. As survivors, we are susceptible to addictions for four primary reasons. Keeping in mind that there are many secondary reasons, but there's four primary reasons. And the first is the fierce emotional pain of our abuse, the shame. Third, the disconnection from the love and approval we claim we crave from our primary caretakers. And the fourth is the brain damage that we suffer as a result of our abuse. It's important to remember that our brain does not know the difference between emotional and physical pain. So when we feel intense pain emotionally, we may reach for a painkiller, just like someone with physical pain. Unfortunately for us, emotional painkillers are often very destructive addictions, okay? So emotional pain is a huge reason why we may turn to an addictive substance or behavior. We're doing the same thing that people do when they have physical pain. We're trying to numb our pain. Our shame from our childhood abuse is often a weapon used against us in the addiction cycle. For example, we may have turned to food to help cope with our emotional pain, but when we binge eat, we feel ashamed of ourselves for doing so. This adds to the storehouse of shame already built up in us due to our abuse. To cope with it, we binge eat again. In this way, addictions can be self-reinforcing actions. Brain damage to our amygdala, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex result in our having poor impulse control, more compulsions, and less of an ability to use reasoning and logic in our decision making. Our emotions feel stronger and we can overreact in emotionally charged situations, which can cause us to turn to addictions with greater frequency than those without brain damage from abuse. And the last one, new research shows a lack of connection in childhood with our families and most importantly, our primary caretakers can be a significant predictor of addiction in adulthood. We are born with a drive to love and be loved by our primary caretaker. When this innate need is thwarted due to family dysfunction and abuse, it results in both a great deal of pain and intense feelings of unworthiness. We can find ourselves falling into addictive behaviors to cope with those feelings. So not only do we turn to addiction to cope with the pain of the abuse, but we turn to addictions to cope with the pain for the lack of connection in our childhood. This is a relatively new um, piece of research that comes into play within addictions, this lack of connection, but it makes perfect sense and it explains why connection is a powerful healing element in recovery from addictions and in our recovery as child abuse survivors. So to cope with addictions, try these tips and strategies. No more shame. Never shame yourself for any addictions you have. These addictive behaviors are coping mechanisms used to help you survive the pain of your childhood abuse. The addictions themselves are not your fault. Own your part. Take responsibility for your addictions and the pain they are causing you and your loved ones. 
These addictions are not your fault, but they are your responsibility to resolve once you become aware of them. Two sides of the same coin, both important. When you get help and treatment for addictions, it is vital to both eliminate the addictive behavior and resolve the underlying cause of having developed the addiction. If you do not resolve the underlying pain and dysfunctional thinking, core beliefs, tied to your addiction, you risk relapse or trading one addiction for another. For example, you may become sober from alcohol, but then develop an addiction to video gaming. Remember, addictions are coping strategies. Identifying and tackling the root cause of them is just as important as changing the behavior. Professional support is best. Seek experienced and qualified help to cope with addictions. Tackling the dual task of the addictive behavior and the underlying trauma is difficult and can actually be dangerous to do without professional help. And I just, I really want to emphasize this next point because it's so important. If you are addicted to drugs or alcohol, you should never quit those substances cold turkey. Okay, so just, that's it, I'm done, I'm not drinking anymore, I'm not doing drugs anymore, just boom, cut it off without medical assistance because it can be life threatening. Okay, addiction, stopping drinking after having been addicted to alcohol for many years can actually result in death because our body is so at that point, it is completely dependent upon that substance. And without it, death can occur. So please never detox without medical support and intervention. Don't be a lone ranger. Join in safe community with other survivors to receive the support and encouragement you need. There is strength in numbers. Being in community with others who have lived your pain and may also have be overcome a similar coping strategy will help you to feel stronger and less ashamed. And it also helps you address that fourth cause of addictions, which is feeling that lack of connection. We have free organized virtual safe support communities where you can practice new skills and become adept at creating healthy habits. Ask us about getting plugged into free online safe support groups for survivors. And if you're looking at this, on the site, you can click there, the PDF is clickable, and you can go to the page that helps you. Yay, you can sign up in our support groups. Yay, it goes over to um, our about section of our YouTube channel and has a, a line by line by line exactly what to do. Let me sit up, I'm like, let me pretend I'm actually working here. Um, <laughs> right, I'm like laying back in my chair. Um, it, it walks you through step by step by step on how to get connected with us and how to get connected into a free online safe support group. So, um, I, uh, <laughs> Matt says, but, but I love the Lone Ranger. <laughs> yeah. But see, the Lone Ranger feels safe. Yes, the Lone because Ranger. we're by ourselves and no one can hurt us, and we don't have to depend on anyone because no one is. No, no. yeah. Um, oh, Alex, um, Alex Keenan Krill says balance is is so. Um, I don't know. It's so something though. I become the life of the party, extremely social, or I am reclusive, a long time. Oh, oh, I think she's trying to say balance is like so difficult, like difficult to to attain. Obviously, it's either one one extreme or that or the next. She's either the life of the party, yeah. or she's um, she's reclusing. So I definitely identify with that, Alex. Most definitely, and identify with the Lone Ranger, Matt. 
Well, you know, uh, we as survivors are good at extremes because we know extremes. We grew up in extremes. If you need an expert in extremes, get a survivor. We are just awesome at extremes. It's that middle point of balance that scares us. Um, so I tell yeah. you, if in, in a in a crisis, um, I think survivors are some of the best people out there to depend on. Oh yeah, my husband calls me a first responder. Like. And it's so true. Like, if there's a traumatic situation or something crazy that goes down, he knows that I'm like instantly composed and I'm like in my element where I know exactly what to do. I stay completely calm. It's just, it's old stuff kicks in. My reptilian brain kicks in or whatever. Right. Right. There, you know? Yeah. Because, well, it's because. Man, you know, if you're raised in traumatic situations and you needed to have that game face or you needed yeah. to pretend everything was okay, right. I mean, I remember crazy stuff going down at my house and needing to be completely composed and keep it together for when the cops came to the door because I was supposed to tell them that everything was fine. I was supposed to lie and say everything was fine. It's like, oh my gosh, I look back at it and I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, why didn't I just, hello, the cops are there to help you. But, like, I wasn't taught that the cops were the good guys no, when I was exactly. little. You were, was, you were given your parents' worldview, <laughs> which is that the cops were bad. Yeah. And um, dangerous, and they were going to hurt you. And they were going to take one of my family members away, and then what was I going to do? I wouldn't have a house. I would have nowhere to go. I would be homeless. I would have no food. Um, and it would be all my fault, so I had to pretend everything was perfect. Wow. Yep. Talk about a double bind. Talk about a catch-22, right? Right. Yep. Talk about a trauma bond. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, this has been a lively discussion on the topic of addictions, um, and I really want to um, emphasize what Bobby said because Dawn brought attention to it, and we put it in red for a reason, y'all. Um, Dawn says, what Bobby is saying now about, um, is very important. Never detox without medical support, please. I know we put it in red, and I know that Bobby used her very serious voice when she was saying it, but we just want I want to look at you all. Like, I want to look at you like in the face and tell you, if you are dealing with an addiction to a substance, alcohol, Xanax, Vicodin, pills, Oxycontin, whatever it is, some sort of a substance, do not try to do this yourself, please. Please, please, please reach out and get professional help. You are worth it. Your life matters. And you could die. You could just die. And even if you're feeling like dying is like the only option and it would be the best thing for you, I want to assure you that that's, that's a fleeting feeling that you're having. And what you really want is for the pain to go away, not for life to end. So please, 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 as Bobby mentioned and as Dawn brought home in the tweet, we, I just want to make sure you guys hear us loud and clear. Please never try to kick a substance on your own. Please, please, please get professional help. Your life matters. And we don't want you, we don't want your body to go into some kind of crazy shock and shut down, um, which it definitely can do. And you won't even have any warning. Like, it'll just do it. So um, I don't mean to be such a Debbie Downer, like, at the end, like, while we're getting ready to go no. into our, our screen shares. But this is no. real serious, you guys. Addiction is serious. This is, you know, we're lighthearted and funny. And, like, we approach this serious topic with such levity and la-da-da. But if this is your life. This, this is your life we're talking about, and you matter to us, and we want you to receive the proper care that you deserve and that you've always deserved. Bobby, your thoughts yeah. on that? You know, and if detox, detoxing is so hard. If you're going to go through that hard work towards the effort of getting to the end and being successful without the substance, um, get the help. You know, don't don't try and detox on your own, um, first of all, because it is just 
gut-wrenchingly hard and second because it can be life-threatening we want to get you through the detox part so you can do the work to tackle your addictions and tackle your trauma so um yeah yeah that's important i um there's there's a there is an allure to tackling it on your own i have in fact my main abuser um in their own words kicked cocaine on my own so I can do anything um, but that's not the smart thing to do yeah they kicked cocaine but there were so many other the one one addiction replaced another replaced another replaced another same with my father you know heroin pills alcohol turned into nicotine turned into bullying he was a bully towards me he would talk nice to me to everybody else and then in front of me he would bully me and tell me I was fat and ugly and stupid and dumb and you know whatever um, and we didn't even mention bullying but I do believe that people compulsively without even knowing that they do it it's just their modus operandi Bobby like like you said earlier sociopathic and psychopathic people but mm -hmm. there can be that element I'm not saying someone that is malignantly antisocial like antisocial personality disorder but I'm saying someone who has that in them that that exploitative behavior that is just a compulsion of theirs um, they lack empathy and perhaps they're undiagnosed but anyway that's an addiction in and of itself and it's just it's very damaging but um, to kick an addiction on your own and to, to toot your own horn saying I'm so awesome because I kicked oxy or, or Vicodin or alcohol or cocaine or heroin or whatever it might be it's not worth that's not a crown that we want you to be wearing. Like, wear a different crown. We want you to be free from the addiction, but we want you to have professional help that you deserve so that you can live your life to the fullest and have fulfilling, amazing relationships. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So Can we're going to... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we're going we're gonna to say thanks for being here to everyone who's here every single week. And um, we love having you guys here. This is the highlight of our week. And um, you guys are the reason we do all of this, everything we do. Um, if, if it's your first time here, we're going to, for the next like five or ten minutes, we're just going to let you know how to get in touch with us, um, where to send an email, how to get plugged into a safe group, um, who we are, what we do, and how often we do it. So Bobby has some awesome screen shares for you. And thanks so much for joining us here tonight, you guys. Come back again next week, every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Okay. Let us look at the ways, whoopsie, that you can get support within our community. We have three Twitter chats a week. And we have our support groups on Facebook. They are all free. They always will be free. And you are welcome to join us in any or all of them. Um, the Twitter chats, the first one's Monday uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time in the U.S. And 6 p.m. in the U.K. The hashtag for that is CSAQT. And then the second one is if you're here with us live, now you're participating with it. Um, the hashtag is no more shame and it is a live video broadcast in conjunction with a Twitter chat. It is at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern and 2 o'clock on Tuesday mornings in the UK. On Tuesday evening, there is sex abuse chat. That's the hashtag sex abuse chat. It is at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern and Wednesday at 2 o'clock in the morning in the UK. If you would like to be a member of one of our Facebook groups, they are private, they are secret. Um, no one will know that you're a member um, and no one will be able to see any of the posts that you make within the group except the members of the group. So I know that there are so many of us that have privacy concerns and I really want to assure you that our support groups on Facebook are secure and they are private if you'd like to join we ask that you follow this four-step process and the first is to go to facebook and like the Re trauma recovery university webpage, and i'll show that your url for you on the next screen 
send Athena and I both friend requests. Um, and then once one of us has accepted your friend request, send the message, I'd like to heal in safe community, or I'd like to join one of your support groups. Something similar to that. Um, if we don't already know you, we may ask you some questions before we admit you into one of those groups. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that you're safe. Um, and we want to make sure that you are not a predator. You are not an unsafe person who will come in to one of our support groups and hurt the people who we protect so strongly to be able to do the work they need to do. So after we have determined that you're not unsafe, we will welcome you into one of the support groups and post an introduction that announces you and introduces you to the group and everyone can welcome you. Um, you can watch the broadcasts every week um, at Monday evening in the U.S., to early Tuesday morning in the U.K. at bit.ly forward slash trauma recovery you and those capitals do matter. Okay. Hang on. There we go. Now let's look at the other one. One more. These are the ways that you can get in contact with Athena and I. Let me make sure I'm sharing to everyone, present to everyone. Okay, there we go. I'm going to make it bigger. These are ways that you can get in contact with us. You can email us. I am Bobby L. Parrish at gmail.com. Athena is Athena Moberg speaking at gmail.com. And there is also our joint email address, no more shame project at gmail.com. On Twitter, I'm Bobby L. Parrish. Athena is Athena Moberg. And Trauma Recovery University is Trauma Recovery U. Those capitals don't matter, Twitter. Capitals don't matter to Twitter. If you'd like to join us on Facebook, there's the Trauma Recovery University Facebook page URL right there. My professional page is Bobby Parrish Coaching and Consulting. My personal page is Bobby Parrish. Athena's professional page is Athena Moberg Speaking. And her personal page is Dawn Athena Moberg. You can find all of our replays on YouTube, Roku TV, or Google Plus. Just do a search for Trauma Recovery University and you will find all of them there. And that's it. Yay! Can, can I do one little um one little share of yeah. our um of our our button? Where did there's our button? There it is. Um, we have our No More Shame November 2016 button. And um, it looks like this. And if you find us on facebook.com forward slash trauma recovery university, you will see this is our avatar. And um, the month of November is when we do the most advocacy work. The very first No More Shame November was in 2014, and that was when we published our very first anthology. And in future No More Shame Novembers, we do plan on publishing another anthology and, and other types of ways to raise awareness about childhood sexual abuse. We have only so far published that one, um, the one anthology so far, but we, we do want, we do want to do more. <laughs> it was, it was just, it, it wasn't a sustainable situation where we're able to do all of the gathering of all of the essays and submissions and then also all of the editing and the publishing and the organizing and everything and the promotion of it all and so looking for some interns who know a lot about the self-publishing process or um, publishers out there who may be interested in publishing um, an anthology of true survivor stories from our brave community members. So, um, Bobby, did you want to um, say goodbye to everybody before um, before we go? You bet. Have a great evening. Um, please be kind to yourself tonight, or if you're watching this on a replay, these chats can be triggering even hours afterwards. So use your good self-care. And I'm so glad that you spent this time with us, and we look forward to seeing you again. 
Yeah, we're, we're grateful for each of you. And thank you so much for all of you who um, showed up tonight on the Twitter stream. And um, a very special welcome to Alex. I'm not sure if Alex Keenan Krill has joined us on a Monday night um, live for Q&A before, but if not, then a very special welcome to her. And um, just all of you who are here every week, we really appreciate you. We appreciate you supporting one another so transparently and vulnerably. It makes a huge difference in our community. You guys are the reason that this community is so powerful and and just beautiful in every way. So thank you so much. I'm Athena Moberg, and this is Bobby Parrish, and we love bringing you everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. Bye, everybody. Thank you.